The story of the Kinnahans and their legacy on the Irish drugs landscape is brought back to the north inner city of Dublin in the mid-70s. After a period of dock-related full employment in the 60s and 70s, the situation got bad as the 70s progressed and containerization came in. Social issues began to rise and in the background, huge amounts of heroin were coming into Europe as Russia had invaded Afghanistan. After reaching the UK first, it wouldn't be long before Irish criminals would want to try and get their share of the profits. And one Irish crime family in particular saw its chance, the Duns from the Dolphins Barn area in Dublin. One of the 14 Dunn children, Larry, decided to switch his bank robbing career to drug trafficking and started to bring heroin to the country. He established a sizable drug network, together with his two brothers Michael and Shamie, which led to a huge heroin plague in working-class communities and the three brothers making a fortune. The Gardaí was not prepared for the heroin epidemic and the devastating problem caught everyone in the country by surprise. It's estimated that at his peak, Larry Dunn controlled 95% of the heroin trade in Ireland. No wonder he became a top priority for Gardaí. After an extensive undercover operation by Detective Michael O'Sullivan and others, Larry was arrested for drug trafficking in 1983. But as the profits in this business were huge, it wouldn't take long before others would fill the void. And this is where the story of the Kinnahans begins. 25 years earlier, in 1957, Christy Kinnahan was born in West London, but the family moved him and his two sisters back to Dublin when he was still young. In the years to come, it proved he was not very interested in education and he failed his leaving cert. He fell in love with a woman named Jean Boylan from the Oliver Bond complex in the south inner city, and three years later, in 1977, their first child was born, Daniel. Another three years later came Christopher Jr. Christie was only 22 years old at the time and tried to make an honest living as a taxi man. However, the lure of quick cash proved too much and he got involved in petty crime. Gardy regarded him as another low-level criminal, but as he witnessed Larry Dunn getting rich, selling his Ford Fiesta for a white limousine and sending his kids to the best private schools, Christie wanted a slice of it. He used an associate to get an introduction to local dealers and ended up helping them organize shipments into the country. He got acquainted with a young heroin addict called Raymond Salinger, who helped him distribute the heroin locally, and when Larry Dunn was out of the picture in the summer of 1985, Christie's dealing operation was in full effect. Instead of basing himself in a working-class flat in the inner city, Christie rented a middle-class apartment in Fairview. He posed as an English businessman and used the apartment as a base to store the heroin before selling it to local street dealers. But in 1986, the Gardaí were tipped off about the operations in Fairview, and Michael O'Sullivan and his team raided the apartment. They found Christie sitting on the couch, eating a sandwich with a huge pile of heroin on the table in front of him. Christie was caught red-handed, with 117,000 Irish pounds worth of drugs stashed in a bag in one of the bedrooms. A year later, Christie's trial came before the courts and he was given a six-year sentence, instead of ten, due to certain circumstances. Christie blamed everything on the Algerian man who was with him in the apartment at the time, and he pretended to be a heroin addict a tactic that apparently worked. Christie believed Raymond Salinger, who was one of the few who knew about the Fairview operation, sold him out to the Gardaí, and he was furious. Salinger fled the country together with his wife and daughter, hoping in time any threat from Christie would die down. But when his wife got sick in 2002, they returned to Ireland. Christie was staying in Amsterdam at the time, and Raymond figured he might have forgotten about the presumed betrayal. However, 17 years after the Fairview sting, Salinger was shot dead in a local pub, and the murder was traced to Christy Kinnahan, showing his ruthless and determined nature. During his time in Mountjoy Prison, where he was jailed for the Fairview operation, Christy met Dublin criminal John Cunningham. Cunningham, an armed robber, had planned to go for the biggest heist in his life in 1986 and decided to kidnap Jennifer Guinness, the daughter of the very fortunate Brewers family. But things did not quite go as planned, and he and his two accomplices, his brother Michael and a third man called Anthony Kelly, were arrested. Cunningham was sentenced to 17 years in prison and ended up crossing paths with Christie in the Mountjoy facility. The years they spent together planning their actions for hours and hours would prove to be vital for their future, as similar aspirations made them become very close. 
By the time Christie got out of prison in 1992, the drugs market had changed as ecstasy had made its entrance and more profits were to be made. By early 1993, Christie was splitting his time between Ireland and Tamworth, Birmingham, and married a Dutch woman, a marriage that would only last six years. Around that time, Christie was back to being low-level and was again building contacts, although he was involved in stolen traveler checks. After 16 grand worth of stolen checks were found during a raid in 1993, Christie was arrested again and charged. However, he decided to jump bail and flee to the Netherlands. There, he started to expand his operations by trafficking firearms and building relationships with people from countries like Colombia and Spain that would eventually enable him to expand his empire in the new century. By 1996, he was sending substantial quantities of drugs back to Ireland. But then, in 1996, two major events took place that changed gangland forever. Crime reporter Veronica Guren was murdered and the Criminal Assets Bureau, or CAB, was introduced. Guren's murder meant the end for the crime gang led by John Gilligan, who was held responsible, although acquitted later on. And at that time, John Gilligan was Christie's only competitor in the Irish drugs market. A void occurred and Christie and his gang were able to fill it, having all the contacts and experience they needed. On the other hand, the introduction of CAB meant that high-end criminals weren't able to spend their money anymore in Ireland. However, Christie was ahead of the curve and had already moved to Amsterdam. And another pleasant surprise was brought to Christie that year as John Cunningham had escaped from prison and made his way from Ireland to Amsterdam using a false passport. The pair was reunited again and business was booming. However, a year later, Christie's dad died back in Ireland, and although Christie knew there was an outstanding arrest warrant related to the stolen traveler's checks, he decided to attend the funeral. Little did he know that the guardian knew about his father's passing and awaited them at the ceremony. He was arrested again and sent to Europe's most secure maximum security facility, Port Leash Prison, for another four years. Lucky for him, he had John Cunningham on the outside running their criminal enterprise from Amsterdam. During those four years in prison, Christie decided to spend his time well. He studied Spanish and Russian and was one of the first inmates who got a computer. He was also one of the first persons who was able to smuggle a mobile phone inside, which was still pretty large around that time, which enabled him to then connect the computer to the then still very new internet. This made it possible for him to communicate with Cunningham and run their business while behind bars. At that point, huge amounts of money from ecstasy dealing in Ireland came in and were brought back to Holland to get exchanged in guilders. It's estimated that around that time, the gang was responsible for 60% of all Irish pound to guilders transactions in Holland. But once again, things took a turn a couple of years later, as a shipment of automatic pistols and 800 kilograms of cannabis was uncovered in Ireland, which could be linked to Cunningham. His Amsterdam mansion was raided by the Dutch police in 2000 and arms and money were found. But that was not all. Also, a ledger was found which revealed that around 31 million euro worth of cannabis and ecstasy had been sent from Holland to Ireland while Christie was in jail. Cunningham was convicted and was sent to jail for seven years. A year after Cunningham was busted, Christie was released from jail. Somehow, Cunningham had managed to successfully stash 10 million euro worth of their criminal proceeds. Since Cab was paying big attention, Christie moved to Belgium, where he started to invest in properties. However, it turned out that the Belgians were much more advanced when it came to financial crimes than the Irish, so Christie needed to move again. This time, he went to Spain. It was the mid-2000s, and Christie became a major player in the narco game, setting up drug routes into Western Europe, working together with Mexican and Colombian cartels and the Russian and Dutch mafia. Spain proved to be the place where Christie would grow one of the fiercest criminal organizations in the world. His international drug cartel is believed to have assets worth over 1 billion euro, and although the net seems to be closing in on his cartel, he now appears to have found a home away from home, probably in Dubai or Africa, enjoying his luxury life. Criminal gangs like the Kinnahan Crime Group and the Hutch family are believed to make millions from their lucrative narco business, arms trafficking, and other illicit activities. But if they can't find a way to hide the origins of their dirty money, they'll never be able to spend their millions without arousing suspicion. And that's why money laundering is essential for criminal organizations that wish to use their earnings effectively. While we mostly hear about the illegal activities of these crime groups, the process of laundering their profits is often shrouded in mystery. 
Irish criminal gangs like the Kinnahan Cartel and the Hutch family involved in illegal activities such as drug and arms trafficking have amassed a fortune that is estimated to be worth billions of dollars. Since the turn of the century, the Kinnahan Cartel, for example, has grown to become a sprawling international drug cartel that is now ranked alongside the Italian Mafia. The cartel, which operates in Ireland, the UK, Spain, and the United Arab Emirates, is believed to have assets worth more than 1 billion euro. Christy Kinnahan, who founded the organization as a multimillionaire who is estimated to have squirreled away a personal fortune in jewelry, properties, yachts, and luxury cars, including a yellow Lamborghini and Bentley, each worth around €200,000. The cartel owns dozens of properties in countries all over the world, like Spain, Thailand, Cyprus, and Dubai. It has invested in high-end holiday resorts, for example in Brazil, sport promotion companies in Asia, and distilleries in Australia. Hundreds of millions of euros are put in high-yield investment portfolios in Asia, and their wealth structure is ever-evolving and highly complex. But let's not underestimate the Hutches. Jerry the Monk Hutch is estimated to be worth around 15 million euro. He built a huge international property network through savvy investments and money laundering schemes. His 12 million euro property empire runs from Dublin to Turkey, including million euro mansions and apartments in Ireland, London, and Spain. His own home in Clontarf is already estimated to be worth a million euro. But his portfolio also contains extensive properties in Kusadasi and Izmir in Turkey and several housing complexes in Bulgaria and Hungary. And to top it all off, he is a silent partner in several pub and auto trade businesses in Ireland. And all this, despite the major blow he got from CAB in 2000, which landed him a 1.5 million euro tax liability bill in 1997. Actually, Jerry Hutch was one of the first ever targets of the Bureau. In short, these criminals do not only make millions, they also spend them, and to be able to splurge, they need to launder their dirty money and they've proven to be extremely creative. In September 2022, a huge Kinnahan-linked money laundering network was uncovered in Spain for which their money man Johnny Morrissey has been arrested. The network was able to handle an astonishing amount of €350,000 of drug profits every single day, summing up to €200 million Euro in 18 months. Although hot vehicles, modified to include secret compartments, were used to move some of the money, the scheme was based on the ancient Hawala system, which means the cash actually had never been physically moved out of Spain. Hawala banking is an informal money transfer system that's commonly used in the Middle East and other parts of the world. It's purely trust-based and allows money to be transferred without actually moving it physically. Instead, the money is transferred through a network of brokers of the system in different countries. When a sum of money, which is intended for another person or criminal gang, is given to a broker in one location, a broker in the other location gives the intended receiver the sum after getting a designated password. For each transaction, a commission is paid to the broker, making them extremely important parts of the money laundering network. The system does not leave a paper trail. It generates no record of money ever existing or any proof of who owns the cash. Morrissey, nicknamed Johnny Cash, is named as one of the key figures of the Kinnahan cartel, being their main money man in Spain. He allegedly used a drinks company called Nero Drinks to launder money for the cartel. Reason for the US to sanction the company, which sells luxury alcoholic drinks in April 2022. Although Morrissey can't be linked to the company on paper, the US Department of Treasury believes the company was owned and controlled by him and partially given to Daniel Kinnahan to compensate for failed drug shipments. It's just one of the dozens of front companies used by the cartel to move drugs and launder the profits. But following the American sanctions, their money laundering schemes needed to be updated. The Kinnahans are currently believed to have a network of money laundering professionals in London, Hong Kong, Dubai, and Bangkok that washes a part of their 1 billion euro fortune through American and British film industries. The network includes accountants, solicitors, and employees in financial services companies who use their expertise to help launder money. They are believed to directly communicate with Christy Kinnahan and his sons through third parties and face-to-face -face meetings. Among them is a Dubai-based expat who oversees a wealth management fund worth more than 100 million euro, which is used to fund the development of entertainment industry projects. According to security sources, the Kinnahan cartel is the true beneficial owner of the fund, 
Allegedly, those projects are developed with cartel fundings and focus on pop culture, youth and music. According to uncovered advertising materials, they involve corporations from Dubai, the United Kingdom and America. One of the Kinnahan's bagmen have been identified as a European national living in Bangkok. He was charged with attempting to transfer 226 million euro kept on deposit in a Hong Kong bank. He's accused of being involved in the sale of gang-owned residences in Thailand, where second-tier members of the cartel reside. The funds are managed by a Hong Kong lawyer who has attempted to transfer money in modest quantities into investment funds in global tax havens. The Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands and the Isle of Man are among them. Christy Kinahan is known for using contacts in Hong Kong because of its lax approach to banking and money laundering. A financial advisor has recently revealed how he was involved in a plot to launder 225 million euro for the Kinahan cartel through the worldwide banking system. According to this man known as Opal, the cartel considered investing large quantities of money in art, wine, cryptocurrency, whiskey and stocks. The man claimed he was asked to launder 60 million euro, but that figure quickly grew to 200 million. His job was to build up banking structures so that large sums of money could be invested in various countries throughout the world. He built a plan in which the Kinnahans would transfer money from China to destinations such as the Cayman Islands, Mauritius, the British Virgin Islands, Luxembourg, Malaysia and Holland. The rise of the Kinnahan cartel from a Dublin street gang to a global criminal syndicate entangled in alliances with Iran and Hezbollah is a chilling example of the ever-evolving nature of organized crime. The concerted efforts of law enforcement agencies across multiple countries spearheaded by the United States have intensified in response to the threat posed by the Kinahan cartel. Imposing sanctions, disrupting financial networks, and pursuing extradition requests demonstrate a resolute commitment to dismantling this criminal empire. But will the cartel ever be brought to its knees? That was it for today's video. What are your thoughts on today's topic? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel if you'd like to see our next videos.